Hello, I'm Jorge Getoso. Welcome to a new program from Washington. On today's show, the issues of immigration, education, and economy with Congressman Luis Gutierrez. Mr. Gutierrez, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Mr. Congressman, is something about what President Obama has proposed regarding immigration and deferred action, for example, with DREAMers, finally is going to pass or the two propositions are dead? Well, look, number one, this is an executive order. So the Republicans have two options uh, to try to stop it. Number one, they can try the courts and they've found the most conservative court in the most conservative area in the country with a very conservative judge. I wish them bad luck. Uh, of course, whatever decision will be taken all the way to the Supreme Court if they challenge the president's authority and prerogative under current law to set aside five million. Four million are the parents of American citizens, which I believe we have a responsibility as the government of the United States to protect those millions and millions of American citizens from being forced to be separated from their parents because their parents are undocumented, number one. The dreamers and the expansion of the dreamers you know, I, I really question that. I mean, it was June of 2012. The president subsequently won re-election five months later with a resounding almost six million votes. Uh, so the public has already said they thought that was a good idea. The other ways to do is legislatively. And I'm just going to go quickly to the chase on that. Look, the president said yesterday, I'm looking forward, I'm optimistic, I'm happy, I'm strong. You know, he was jovial, too. But one thing he was clear about was, I will veto anybody that tries to undermine my executive authority. Having said that, that means the president, they have to, in order to overcome a veto, you need 67 senators. And they now, don't have it. Well, they have 54. I wonder who are these uh, 13 other Democratic senators that will join the Republicans in overturning something that the Democratic senators have all been fighting for. So look, it's not going to go. They need a resolution to the Homeland Security budget that doesn't include uh, jeopardizing the ability of 5 million undocumented workers in this country of getting right with the law and being set aside from deportation. Let's be clear about one thing. Wall Street Journal, New York Times, editorial boards agree on absolutely nothing. They agree on immigration. U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the largest labor federation, the AFL-CIO, spend tens of millions of dollars advocating for positions, different positions here in the Congress of the United States and nationally. They both agree we need comprehensive immigration reform. Catholics, Protestants, Evangelicals, Muslims, Jews, all agree. The only place in America where people haven't been able to reach an agreement is in the House of Representatives. So guess what? They're going to have to let this go. There is not popular support in America for punishing 5 million people that the president wants to set aside, especially when you take into consideration geopolitical considerations, which, which have taken on an importance, right, a real immediate importance, given what's going on in France and in other European countries uh, with the, uh, uh, the Islamist State and their, the jihadists, which they have called out to do jihad. We did have an opportunity to interview Raul Grijalva, Congressman Raul Grijalva from Arizona. Arizona and, uh, and exactly from Tucson. And Mr. Grijalva was very clear. He said, listen, we, the U.S., we have to look ourselves to the mirror and see who we really are. And understand that these are our neighbors, the people who are coming to the U.S. And these people, said Grijalva, they are not coming to uh, take over our jobs, our hospitals, our schools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They are economic refugees, for, in many cases, for the policies of the U.S. regarding Absolutely. economic. Do you agree? Yes. I, look, one of the reasons that in 1993 I voted against the North American Free Trade Agreement wasn't because I didn't want Mexico to do better but that I felt that workers were really the ones, they were going to be winners and losers, but workers were going to be losers. Workers were going to be losers in the United States, and workers were going to be losers. Look, I come from Puerto Rico. I remember the industrialization of Puerto Rico. My parents 
migrated along with a million other Puerto Ricans in the 50s and the 60s because Operation Bootstrap it was going to be a change in Puerto Rico. We were going to go from agriculture to uh, industry. Well, you know what happened. There was a displacement of people. And just the same way my mom and my dad had to leave Puerto Rico along with hundreds of thousands of other Puerto Ricans to the United States, which, by the way, is why I'm having this conversation with you as a direct result of that economic policy. I knew it was going to happen. You can't have farmers in Nebraska and in Kansas compete with farmers, right, in Mexico. It's, it's not competitive. You knew there were going to be a winner and a loser. And as you take those people, those people are going to go from the rural area to the cities, and eventually they're going to cross the border to the United States. But secondly, and I think this one, is critical. The consumption of drugs in the United States of America is, I believe, the greatest, is the greatest thing that, that, that debilitates, that cripples, that undermines civil society in Mexico and throughout Latin America. And when you do that to civil society, that means people are not safe. In the United States, we're used to dialing 911 and a police officer shows up. That is not the case. And so it's our insatiable demand for drugs that allows the drug cartels in Honduras and in Guatemala Central and in America. Mexico and Central America. You know, we go and we have a war and we're successful in Colombia. Well, where the hell did you think they were going to move? They're going to move somewhere where the heat isn't at. Then we do it in Mexico. So if you squeeze Mexico and you squeeze Colombia, look at a damn map. You should know where the drug cartels are going to go. Now, those are American dollars that are crippling civil society in those countries. And those are American weapons bought in the United States. So all I'm trying to say, yes, there's an economic component to this, but there are other components. So what is in America, we need to fight the war on drugs because to the extent we're successful, so is Latin America successful. Let's not do it for the good of Latin America. Let's do it for our own good. But as we do good for ourselves, we do good for them. Mexico is the second largest, right, importer and consumer of American goods. The sec that means there are millions of Americans who wake up each day to a good paying job thanks to the consumers in Mexico that buy our goods. Let's understand that we are interconnected and to the extent that we have agreements that are that are free trade agreements but are fair trade agreements everybody wins everyone wins um well you know the the famous activist malcolm x mm -hmm. he says be very careful with the mass media because you could have the danger of ending up hating the oppressed people and loving the, the oppressors. oppressors. <laughs> because the question in that case is, we are seeing that situation. We have uh, 11 million uh, undocumented people in the U.S. who basically are bringing much more than we are taking to the government. Mm -hmm. And you don't see exactly what you just finished to say in the mass media. Do you think that the mass media is an accomplice of the, if you want, the Republican agenda? Here's what I think. I think our neighbors immediately to the south of us, uh, we haven't put the same kind of importance as we've put in Europe and we've put in Africa or we've put in China and the rest of Asia. I think if you're truly going to give an orientation to the public through the news media, maybe if you're in the United States of America, you might want to start with the local news. And by the local news, I mean those in our hemisphere. Before our neighbors. <laughs> our neighbors. Because those most directly impact you and your day-to-day -day life. They're also your friends, your allies. And from a geopolitical point of view, they should be your allies. And from an economic point of view, they should be your trading partners, your first. Why are we going to let the Chinese come in to Latin America? We should be the first ones there selling goods. But anyways, my point is this. Yes, they have not done still not as important as we should be. They haven't understood our relevance. I like to say this. There are still workers that are invisible to America. 
and the 11 million are becoming less and less invisible. They're showing themselves more and more, but we need to do more. Another subject, education. For example, President Obama is proposing two years of free community college. What do you think? First of all, I do remember I come from, my mom went to sixth grade, my dad ninth grade. Then he went back to high school later on in his adult life, but basically sixth and ninth grade. Because my dad came from a generation in which people didn't go to high school, mm -hmm. right? Why? Well, number one, they had to start working a lot earlier in their lives, mm -hmm. and there wasn't anybody to sustain them. You know, when you were 14, 15 years old, you were expected to already begin to contribute. Having said that, when I went, I remember kids, when I graduated in 1971, most kids did not go to college. Most did not go to college. They went to Helen Curtis, and they went to Zenith, and they went to Motorola, and they went to a slew of jobs that high school graduate was fine, right? Most jobs today require greater than a high school education. It is not my graduating class of 1971. Therefore, we should take the appropriate steps, just like we met a high school diploma, something that was obtainable and free and accessible to all. Now we need to make college free and accessible to all. It must be accessible to the public. So in Chicago, my mayor, Rahm Emanuel, has instituted a program, which the president mentioned last night. Mm -hmm. There you go. Kudos to Chicago. Uh, you graduate with a 3.0 out of 4 point average from mm -hmm. high school. You go to your first two years of college at any city college in the city of Chicago for free. Mm -hmm. Counts your books, too. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means there's a lot of happy kids out there that aren't going to have the kind of debt and are going to be motivated. You Look, you got to make it feel like it is natural to graduate from high school and go straight to college. It has to be a natural, logical segue. Just like you wouldn't stop at eighth grade and say, oh, this is it. No, you, nobody thinks eighth grade. Eighth grade graduation is the beginning of a freshman year mm -hmm. of high school. High school should be the beginning of a freshman year in a college. And I think it's a wonderful national program. We need it for our nation. In the city of Chicago, it has a special um, uh, benefit in that because it's a city-run program, there are no federal funds, mm -hmm. uh, our dreamers, who applied for the president's mm -hmm. executive action, they can go to our city colleges for the first two years for free too. And the fact that uh, 600,000 dreamers, for example, yeah. uh, could, could eventually could be sent back, if you want, mm -hmm. to, to, to be extreme, mm -hmm. to be deported, means that they don't have the opportunity to get education, right. to have well, college education. They don't have an opportunity to get it. But let me just say this. I think we should find more affordable ways for them. We, look. We can't get the federal government to sanction a Pell Grant as though they were American citizens. I understand that, okay? Would I like to change that reality? Yeah, but I'm not, that's not a fight that I know we're going to win. Mm -hmm. But here's what. If I am a young person in America and I graduate from high school and I'm going to college, you know what? If you go and you get in-state tuition, as you can in my state of Illinois, or in New York, or in California, interesting, even in Texas, mm -hmm. you get in-state tuition. What does that mean? How many Americans born in the United States of America don't go on to college and work during their college years in order to afford that college? How many of them don't take out loans in order to afford that college? So look, from my point of view, there is hope and there is the possibility uh, for them to do well. When I went to college, I worked. I worked most of the time I went to college. It was a necessary component. So they're going to work. Do I want them to have more? Do I want them to have everything my daughter had? Yes. But this gives them the opportunity to go to school and to work. You know what? They, they, they lead such wonderful lives of, of, of joy, right, and of courage. Look, just give them a work permit, right? And it's amazing what they will do with a work permit, right? They're not American citizens. They understand that. But the only flag that they've ever pledged allegiance to is the flag of the United States of America. And they are Americans in everything but a piece of paper. And eventually, America is going to give them that piece of paper. Because that's the historical route that we've always taken and, and eventually accomplished. Some figures that are worrisome for many. 
uh, first of all, two out of three college graduated in the U.S. ends up with uh, loans of $100,000 or more. Now talking about disparity. Mm -hmm. Some figures from the IMF. Between 2008 and 2013, 95% of the profits in the business of the U.S. went to the hands of the 1%. 90% got poorer to the levels before the Depression. One in six Americans need food assistance. One in seven food stamps. It's been pretty much agreed on that disparity, inequality happens to be one of the biggest problems of the U.S. and we heard it, President Obama, in the State of the Union address. If you put two and two together, if you are keeping uh, people out of college or, or become sort of an elitist way to reach uh, college education, if you keep the people like coming to the U.S. In this illegal stance, some someone even say, you know, the most skeptical and say, well, you know what, this is modern slavery. Uh, what is all that talking about the U.S.? How worried are you about that sort of figures? Look, I'm going to look at it a little more closer to home. So I was in Congress in the 90s, and now it's 2015, and the people that live in my district, if they earn $50,000 then, they earn $50,000 today, but stuff costs a lot more money 20 years later. So that's been happening. So wages have stagnated, income has stagnated, unless you're the 1%. Now, it's, it's not about class warfare, it's just a fact. 50% of all the wealth in America is owned by 1% of the population, and the other uh, 45 percent, the next 5 percent has it. I mean, there is a disparity. So I think the president spoke to that. You've got to give hope. You've got to give opportunity. You've got to give the possibility of doing well to everyone that makes up the society. And I think the first way you can do that. So here's what I did. I took out my calculator and your public can do the same thing and take 174,000, divide that right by uh, 12. And that'll tell you how much a member of Congress makes every month, right? Almost $15,000, $14,500. The minimum wage in the United States of America is $15,000 a, a year. A year. And you make what it a in member one month. of Congress makes in a month. In one month, what we make in one month, we expect an American worker to live on an entire year. Try it, said the Try president. Well, the president but that, that was the point. He didn't go because, you know, I don't think the president wanted to be like me and this, on your program today and really put it in the face of the We Republican. could invite him. We could invite him. But my point is, isn't there just a little bit of immorality in that and not finding is it? a way? Well, I think, I, I think we should question ourselves, our sense of justice, our sense of fairness a sense of a representative democracy that says, well, I don't have a problem. Of course you don't have a problem. No wonder you don't understand why it is that somebody needs assistance in sending their kids to college or in health care or if they get sick. You know, as a member of Congress, we got health care. If I get sick, I, I don't, if my kids get sick, I get to stay with them. I'll just call you in the media, send out a press release, and say, sorry, I'm spending the week, and I'll, I que buen padre. His children are sick and he's a good husband. When my wife was ill, I put a notice in the record. Guess what? Don't expect me next week. My wife. American workers can't do that because there is no paid leave for when there is illness. There is no paid guaranteed leave when there is a new baby. You know, this Congress, I just saw, they sent me, I just got one from a guy running for the Chicago City Council. And there he was. He says, he says, I grew up in this neighborhood, and I married Ann, a local girl. We went to the same church all of our lives, and our children are going to that church. And then there's the picture of the beautiful kids, him and his wife. So no, vote for me because I'm a good family man, right? Local church, local kid. You know, why is it that in Congress, politicians love taking pictures with their kids and with their wives, but they don't want to vote for families? in order to, so they can take care of those kids, so they can take care of those wives, so they can make sure that those families are, uh, are, kept, are kept together. So here's my point. I think something's got to be said when a member of Congress earns in a month what we pay the minimum wage worker. 
I think we should begin with $15 an hour. I think $15 so an hour. Raising a, the minimum I wage. I think we should raise the minimum wage. We should, we should, we should more than double it, uh, the minimum wage. I think it would be necessary. In the city of Chicago, my mayor, Rahm Emanuel, says 13 bucks. Work in the city of Chicago, it doesn't matter what you do, 13 bucks. Think about it a moment. $13 means about 26000 a year. Now, if you're like my mom and my dad, which I always like to use as the example because they both worked. There's nothing wrong. My wife worked and I worked. That's what a lot, most Americans do. It takes two salaries to make it happen. So 26 and 26 is 52000 Now, you got two kids. You got a chance. You have a chance in America. But at $7.25 an hour, two people making 15 grand a year, 30000 what chance do you have? You do not. You live for all intents and purposes in poverty. And then the company you work with is paying you the minimum wage. They go, well, you can just go get some food stamps and have the taxpayer subsidize the lack of salary that I give you. Why don't you go get a voucher from the government so they can help pay for your rent, subsidized by the rest of it. Look, we have to stop subsidizing companies in America. Who by, makes by, 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 Because if I'm a low-wage earner and I have children and I qualify for Medicaid, I'm going to get Medicaid. I'm going to get food stamps. That's what nutritional programs are for, so if you're hungry. But there's something sinful about two people working full-time jobs, having a couple of kids, and living in poverty. There's something wrong with that. Solution. Solution is we increase the minimum wage. I say we double it. We make a national standard of $15 an hour as the minimum wage so that we can begin to address. It's a beginning step, but I think it's an important step. But could be, if you want, you, you could say, well, that could be even a band-aid in terms of you're helping someone to reach the minimum uh, in terms of expectations. But you were mentioning the sinful, uh, sort of ethical, uh, mm -hmm. moral. Yeah. Uh, what you could do to try, eventually, try to convince the 1% that you cannot have the 99% of your neighbors living mm -hmm. across the door with very little hopes of expectation because it's, it's, my question is, is it really a moral issue? It's just, it has to do with values. Well, it has to do with values and it has to do with who we are as a nation. And I think that in the end, we will address the issue. But if we, we, we need to address the issue of educational inequality that exists, people getting educated and others not getting educated, who eats in America? We still have millions of families that go to sleep every night hungry lack of basic um, housing. I mean, there's some people that live in housing that, that reflects third world country kind of standards in America. And that does exist in our, in our nation. That's unfortunate. And let's stop blaming the victims because, you know, we always want to incentivize the entrepreneur, the wealthy. Well, if we just give him a tax credit, he'll have more money after he makes his profit and he'll take those profits and he'll create opportunities for the rest of us. No, he won't necessarily. But what's happening is, think about it, Aetna, pretty large insurance company, they have made a decision that the economy is so strong that they don't want to lose their employees. So you know what their minimum wage is? $16 an hour. That's corporate America. Now, I would hope they would do it because out of the goodness of their house or their values, and I won't question that. But really what they don't want is be rated because as jobs get created, as there's more competition, people will leave this job to go. So their minimum wage, that is the clerk at Aetna, makes $16 an hour. I'm not crazy. It's shameful. I mean, I'll pay more for a cheeseburger at McDonald's or a Big Mac or to get my breakfast if I see somebody across the way. That, you know, they keep going, oh, those minimum wage, those are just kids. That's bullshit. They're not kids. There are men and women working full time in the fast food industry to raise their families. More and more we find people earning, the majority of people earning the minimum wage are full time wage seekers. And sometimes it's really shameful because they need to have a couple of jobs. That's why I always say, you know, all those immigrants, they don't want to work. No. You know what your problem should be? You should think about limiting them how many jobs when we legalize them they get. Because they love to work. They have an interest. 
if you've always, think about it, if you have always been poor, if you have always feared hunger, if you've always feared deprivation, when you finally get something, what do you do? You get as much of it as you can because you remember the times when there was nothing. You don't want to return to them. That is why, like in China, the Chinese save 40% of all their money because they go, we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know our situation. We might get sick. We might need to go to school. We're not. Look, problem is that, like my kids, they've never known. My kids have never known what it is to be hungry, what it is to be without a house, without the heat, electricity, a good book. Um, they've never known. Too many Americans don't know. But when the immigrants who come from very poor countries and they come here, they know. They know. You know, again, they remind me of my, you know, like my, my wife, Soraya, she was born in Moca, Puerto Rico in 1956. And she came here when she was two. They had to go down to the river to get the water. Mm -hmm. That doesn't sound like such a long time ago, right? Her family understood what it was like not to have electricity that flowed through the house guaranteed and what it was like to have flowing water. Look, it all depends on your perspective. And so what I say is immigrants are also good to America because they bring this entrepreneurial working experience uh, that we should all be very proud and we should try to emulate. Congressman Luis Gutierrez, thanks very much for joining us. It's been a us. pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Good to see you again. Thank you.